Chris, good to see you. I hope you have a nice night. Oh, well, I promise I'll do better. Hey, Bill. It's great to see you. Has everybody got white balance and everything they're set? Well, so far, how do you like Hannibal? Uh, it's great. You know, it's very much like the, uh, the community where I went to college. And I went to a, a college that is really a sister school of Hannibal LaGrange, Washita Baptist University down in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. The communities are similar, and uh, both of the, the schools are similar in that they're uh, Southern Baptist connected, Christian liberal arts college. Um, I am a proud graduate, served as a trustee there. Two of my three children graduated from, uh, from that school, and the one who didn't had the good sense to marry a girl who did. So we have a long uh, heritage in my family of being related to uh, a uh, four-year Christian liberal arts college. So I love being here, and I appreciate what this school stands for. Given the current lay of the land in terms of the GOP field, if you could go back, would you run for the Republican nomination? No, I mean, I think the decision I made was the right one for now, and I don't rule out something for the future, but uh, this year the environment, I think, is so incredibly toxic, and unfortunately, uh, so much of the focus is not on solving problems, but it seems to be on destroying the other people who are running. Um, I think that's unfortunate because the country needs to resolve some issues. And as a person who served as a governor for 10 and a half years, you really learn in that capacity to be uh, the, a pragmatist. It doesn't mean you don't have strong convictions and deep beliefs. And I think my ideological conservatism could be placed up against anybody's. But you also understand that you can campaign with this sort of orthodoxy but you must govern with a sense of realizing you don't own all the moving parts. And I'm not sure either side fully understands that right now. With the Iowa caucus coming up, from your perspective, tell us what it takes to, to run a campaign before the caucus and what it takes to maintain the momentum of the Iowa caucus. A lot of people will look at polls and assume that that's a predictor of the caucuses, but it isn't because the caucus is all about really getting organized on the ground and having people who are willing not just to come out and spend 15 minutes to vote, but who are willing to go through the snow and ice on a cold January night and spend three or four hours uh, in some uh, rather drafty school auditorium in a caucus environment, very different than the traditional uh, primary election. So what happens is the people who end up choosing the uh, winner of the caucus are very dedicated to the candidate. So it's, it's really, ha it has more to do with voter intensity than simply voter turnout. And it's a good indication of how um, intense the voters feel about a particular candidate. So when I see people who are not spending time in Iowa, my thought is they're not going to do well in the caucuses. I don't care what the poll numbers show, because they're not organized and they're not out there counting uh, noses as to how many people will show up on January 3rd and vote for them. Is this long, uh, longer drawn out to nomination process uh, going to become the new norm where we see a, a 14, 16, 18 month uh, presidential campaign now? I, I think the whole process is too long as it is and it it requires too much money. It becomes almost an obscenity how much money a candidate has to raise just to get in the game much less to stay on his feet and it, it would be such a benefit I think to the country uh, if the whole process started later and then was more condensed, but nobody can dictate that in a country where we have freedom of speech and people can go out and organize as soon as they want to. But I, I do think that the process has gotten out of control. People forget that uh, Ronald Reagan, for example, announced his candidacy in December, uh, I believe it was December of 1979. Bill Clinton announced his candidacy in October of 1991. This is a time when people say, well, if you haven't made your announcement, you know, in the spring or the early summer, then, you know, it's too late. Um, I, don't, I don't think that that's the case, but uh, it just gets backed up more and more, and the result is people actually get tired of the campaign and the candidates before they really need to be getting uh, on fire for them. Do you see momentum for the uh, conservatives carrying over from the gains in the House in 2010 into uh, this, this year in the Senate, keeping the House and I think, 
I would rather be a conservative than a liberal going into this election cycle for sure. Uh, report came out just today that said that we're probably going to see a 9% unemployment or higher all the way through the election cycle. That does not bode well for uh, the president and for the policies that he's pushed. But by the same token, I would warn Republicans not to get complacent and not to assume that people are in love with them because they're not. And I think one of the re Republicans' greatest challenges right now is to put forth a concrete agenda specifically spelling out not the how they are opposed to the Democrats, but what they would do specifically to get Americans back to work, what they would do specifically to get the economy back on track, and to resolve some of the real challenges that we face. Can you explain how you, the, the TV thing all came about for you? When the campaign was over, I actually had offers from uh, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News to, uh, uh, to be a contributor and to an analyst for them. And, um, you know, I felt Fox was probably the best fit for me. And then they approached me about doing not just an analysis, but uh, hosting a show. And from, from there it happened. And I, I don't think any of us could have imagined how it turned out. But, you know, consistently we have the number one show on the entire weekend and more viewers watching our show than all the other cable news channels combined. So it's been a very, very successful run. And uh, I think a lot of people appreciate uh, that it's a little different than what they see on a lot of uh, cable TV. Uh, we certainly deal unapologetically with politics, but there's some variety in music and entertainment, and uh, I think that's a good balance, and certainly I enjoy it more than, it, than if it was just wall-to-wall, -wall, uh, hardcore political commentary. Do you have a favorite right now? No, I really don't. I mean, I know most, well, I know all of them. And most of the guys who are running uh, are friends of mine. And, you know, I, I think what we've seen is the fluidity of this primary. Every week somebody else has moved into the sort of number two spot to challenge Mitt Romney. Um, it's still very, very uh, open. Any one of six or eight people could, you know, become the nominee of the party. So, uh, I'm kind of enjoying the opportunity to watch it play out and not have to take a uh, position on it, a particular candidate. As we see uh, Herman Cain go through uh, his uh, troubles with the media, uh, Rick Perry kind of the punchline, give us your perspective as a former candidate. When the TV cameras are off, when, when the campaign staff is away, what's that like to, to, to go through that day in, day out to not only defend your character but keep your campaign rolling? You have to realize there is no such thing as an unguarded moment. There's no such thing as a, uh, a microphone that's off. Every move, every word is being recorded both in video as well as in audio. And even when you're behind closed doors, uh, you have to still remember that the next thing out of your mouth could end your campaign. And it's a pretty daunting uh, position to be in. Uh, campaigns can be very unforgiving in terms of making a major blunder, and it's very difficult to recover from it. Uh, sometimes I think if you make a blunder, how you handle the blunder becomes as important uh, and can overshadow the blunder. In other words, you, you could redeem yourself dramatically, um, but you could finish yourself off if you don't show the ability to roll with the punch and to get back up and to take advantage of it. Uh, given the nature of the uh, job of being the president of the United States, isn't that a good thing to have in the campaign, that kind of day-to-day -day stress? It, it is a good thing to see how a person can react under pressure. Can they handle the pressure of uh, sort of the hot lights of uh, a debate? The only thing that's unfortunate is that if, if that is characteristic of a person who cannot handle uh, the ability to think quickly and respond quickly, yeah, I think that probably tells us that person might not be the one we want as a president, because there are going to be moments, whether it's negotiating with a foreign leader, or whether it's uh, talking with members of Congress, or whether it's dealing with the uh, American people in a moment of a crisis, where you can't have someone who uh, simply can't deliver. The one thing, though, that I hope doesn't happen is that we are so harsh with every blog and with every commentary that people are afraid to be who they are. And so we end up with very plastic candidates who are tightly scripted to the last degree. And then the voters never get a chance to really know who that person is because the handlers are going to keep that person in the bubble 
and never let them get out and be a real person. And I think all of us as Americans lose when that happens. We have time for about one more question to either of our student workers or students want to ask a question? I'll get two, yours and his. Okay, go. go ahead. What's your definition of a perfect president? There is no perfect president. One of the mistakes I think that we've made in America is to view the presidency almost as if it's a monarchy. And one of the geniuses, uh, I think, of our, of our founders in creating the kind of presidency that we would have was that the president is to be a servant of the system and of the people, not uh, elevated to nobility. And if we really understand that, what we understand is that we elect someone from among us, not someone above us, but someone from among us who has our flaws, uh, though has certainly the qualities of leadership. And one of the reasons that I think Republicans are struggling is they keep looking for the perfect candidate. He doesn't exist. She doesn't exist. There is no such thing. You just have to find someone who you believe can best carry uh, the load. You mentioned that HLGU was similar to your alma mater. How did going to an evangelical liberal arts school affect who you became? It was a, a very positive impact on me, and frankly, I believe that the education that I received was equal to, if not superior, than an education that I would have received anywhere. I have uh, run against and debated and uh, bested people who were uh, Harvard Law graduates. I never felt that my education underprepared me to stand on the stage with them. In fact, if anything, I felt that uh, a liberal arts education gave me a distinct advantage, uh, something I believe in very strongly because you, you are exposed to a lot of the disciplines of study. You're prepared to, uh, to look at life in a, in a big picture way, not just uh, with the very narrow focus of your own career choice. Uh, I was just on the Yale campus a few weeks ago. Extraordinarily bright and wonderfully courteous and delightful students, but frankly, no more uh, outstanding than the students at my alma mater or the students at Hannibal LaGrange. And I think it's, uh, you know, to me, a great affirmation when I go to a school like Yale and I have a couple of hours of exchange with students and a forum and a Q&A, and then I go to a Christian school like Hannibal LaGrange or to Washita, my alma mater, where I was a month ago, and I really don't detect that I'm dealing with uh, students who are uh, any less than in their intellectual capacity or their uh, even particularly their overall mental horsepower than I have with the Ivy League schools. Well, thank you very much. I know they want to get me off to the dinner and do what they brought me here to do. So thank you very much for coming out. And by the way, is that a, that's not a Cardinal jacket, is it? That's a Cleveland Indian. Cleveland. You get away with that here? They let you do that? You're not a threat. <laughs> Ooh, that, that was, that it's not, it's was not a really. <laughs> you must be from Cleveland.